Alrighty, so I'm going to do a news of the week episode one day earlier than I anticipate to do so because tomorrow it turns out we are actually going to have free MLS team that's going to be in CCO action because originally tonight uh, CF Montreal was going to be playing against Santos Lagoon uh, in the second leg, but then yeah, the big O happened. Uh, if you as any person from Montreal, you know that the big O Oh, is definitely a stadium that it's hard to believe that it's still still standing, even though it's just such a li liability to the c city itself. And apparently, another problem with the Big O is the fact that you know it's been snowing a lot in Montreal, and also there's been freezing rain in the area, and it just feels like it's unsafe in terms of playing it, especially with the way that the roof looked like there could be a possibility that it can collapse again and for those wondering well why exactly have they not replaced the roof well they have tried to do so but now i've heard that they they are planning to do so uh probably in, in 2024 instead of originally saying that they were going to to do it last year but overall it's just a big mess right now and i also know that some people will say well why don't they just play at start saputo and just do what the canadian national team does uh no i'm pretty sure sure montreal is not going to take take that chances and especially it's also kind of dangerous to play a, a game in freezing zing ring not just to the playoffs but also the spectator too like the concourse is going to be really slippery whenever it's in a freezing ring condition and that again that's just a no no go in term terms of that and that that's why the game is going to be delayed to tomorrow which by the way the game is actually going to be kicking off at the same time uh when the colorado rapids is going to be playing against Comunicaciones. so you know it's a good preparation of what i'm going to have to deal with in a couple of days time and really for these next couple of months which is i'm going to have to try to keep keep an eye on two games or at least once the mls season begin i'm going to have to try to keep up four games at a time and kind of just getting back to the normal routine of trying to watch as many MLS games as possible. But that being said, getting back to the news of the week. Well, we definitely had some some big news that came out of MLS leading up to the regular season. And by the way, this is the final news of the week I'm going to be doing before the regular season begin. Uh, we start off with the Houston Dynamo. Uh, they are report that they have made it an offer for Mexican international midfielder uh, Hector Herrera. Now, I'm not quite sure exactly how much they offer him. I'm assuming it's probably going to be a lot because I'm pretty sure Atletico Madrid, even though, you know, Hector Herrera has been kind of an outcast with Atletico Madrid, you know, they're not going to let, let him go for a cheap amount of money. And, you know, the Dynamo, one thing I will say that they, they have definitely done a much better jo job this offseason is that they finally start to, to spend some money. And it's all credit with their, their new ownership that that they have and especially uh their owner Ted Seagulls have finally started to to prove people well that yeah he's going to be finally showing that the, this team to be a very ambitious team and started to finally be like the the other MLS team that wants to spend money to to win games and you know I've also said before while this will definitely make the Houston Dynamo one of the more hated team because yeah, uh, if there is one player that that aggravate a lot of U.S. men's national team fan, it's Hector Herrera. And him coming to MLS, you know, I, I know that there's all, always that that talks about, you know, that there there's the talks of uh, the the likable people, players in this league. But sometimes it's all, always good to talk about the hate hate full player in this league or players that is hated by by fans i mean you know there's a reason why david ochoa even though i know there's a lot of people hated for his antics i actually you know i don't mind in a way way where i'm glad that we have have a villain because again in a league like like this it's always great to have heroes and also have villain and in this case you know if hector, hector herrera is going to be joining the dynamo yeah he's definitely going to be a villain to ev every sing single fan base but it's also a, a good strategy for the dynamo to finally get some casual fans into to the stadium i mean i've said before you know it feels like this is this is a franchise that it's still mind-boggling why they're still playing in mt stadium when they have one of the, the biggest latino and hispanic population in the country and also the location can't be the, the reason i mean the location is literally in downtown it's in a perfect location but yet time after time we see pnc c field getting three qu quarters uh or being a quarter their fall and being three quarter empty if they can get hector Herrera, i can guarantee that the attendance will definitely be much better even i'm not quite sure if that's going to improve this dynamo team because you know with hector herrera 
Yeah, his, his career path, you know, he is started to getting up to, to that age, and he's definitely in, in, a, in a bit of a, a decline. And for a team that is currently rebuilding, you definitely don't want to take a player that, I mean, unless if they're they're using it just for marketing reason, which it feels like this is clearly the case, then it, it, it makes sense. But for a guy that is is trying to get their, their, their rebuild going and get them back to competitiveness... Uh, I don't think Hector Herrera is go going to be the long-term solution, at least for this team. Uh, now, Minnesota, uh, they have re-signed Luis Almeria as a DP player. So, you know, this, of course, of course is another their deal that, just like what I said with the last News of the Week episode when the Loons signed Kirby Arriaga, it's not a big surprise because, you know, the Loons has been dying to, to say that they have signed Luis Almeria. It just gets to a point where I'm like, just announce him. Like, you know he's going to be playing... For, for your team just say that that you have officially signed him and that is exactly what happened this week though I will say that I'm kind of not happy the fact that they made him a, a designated player I mean yes I know he definitely has the 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 characteristic of being a DP player but one thing that I'm kind of disappointed is the fact that when the loon signed Luis Amaria in his first team I don't think he was actually a DP player but more like a high tam player and also it's not a good look to have have two DP in in uh in one spawn and that again unless you know if if both Amaria and who knew is going to play well in that two striker her kind of formation that maybe adrian heap that wants to kind of put out which you know that's even questionable too because i know adrian heap last season he rarely put out the two two striker position but if that's going to of course work out then i have no problem with it but if it if Heap is going to just go with the one striker her, uh Kind kind of formation and maybe put Amaria or or who knew out of position. Yeah, this this just does not not look good. The fact that they they just burn one of the DP spot on literally the same position and now basically this team team you know they're they expected to perform because now they have all three DP locked locked up and that you know if they they go on a bad run like they did in the beginning of last season, oh they really have no flexibility in terms of maybe bring in another big name player on a DP contract in the summer. Now, speaking of DP, uh, the Chicago Fire also signed another, another DP. Uh, they signed Atlas striker Jero uh, Torres as a young DP. Now, from what I also heard is that it seems like he's not going to be a right being to this team until May. So, yeah, he's he's kind of one of those, those players that, you know, no, an MLS team decide to sign him on a, a pre, pre-contract. pre Though, I will say that from what I've heard, he is definitely going to be, be a real real deal. And especially, he's... he's Currently at a team that won won the championship in the in the club Clausura or was it the app I think it's the Apertura season. I always get co confused because you know in in Liga MX they have the Apertura and Clausura this season. But yeah, you know I've heard a lot of of people said that he is definitely a, a, a real deal and that yeah it's also going to be interesting to see see how he's going to compete with Shabilko for that striker position or if Ezra Henriksen is going to go with a two striker position with both Torres and Shabilko they're going up front but either way it's another example of the fire started to take take that major step of finally be, being a competitive team for this upcoming season uh Elena so they have officially signed Dom Dwyer off of free agency and this of course should not surprise anybody because you know we knew this was going to happen like as soon as there was report that it seemed like Dom Dwyer is going to be signed with the with Atlanta United we knew that it was go going to happen and this of course was official and it's also kind of ironic the fact that Dom Dwyer basically signed with Atlanta United because I'm pretty sure he was one of the most hated pl player er, in in the Atlanta United fan base when he was with Orlando City and it's kind of almost shot him fire the fact that now he's going to be part of part of Atlanta and they're the same fan base that hated him now almost kind of for forgive him because now he has joined their team though as i said before you know i'm not sure if this this of course will work out i mean he's obviously going to be be a backup striker to joseph martinez and it just it also kind of makes me feel like Atlanta is trying to do the same thing they did before which is signing these kind of outcast mls player that is was way past their prime and hope that maybe they can get, can do well and it turns out that of course is not not the case so we'll, we'll see whether or not if dom dwyer you know you know is going to be joining those late this player that just never work out for Atlanta United never discover the the good form that they used to have or maybe he's going to be a good good backup to Joseph Martinez in in that team uh now RSL have signed defender Johan Kappenhoff off of free agency and I think this is a good signing for RSL to 
kind of sign a utility player that I, I always felt like Johan Kephoff was kind of underappreciated doing his, his time with the Chicago Fire. I mean, I know he's used more as a utility player, but I thought he, he was a, a decent player or two in, in his position. And again, RSL does a good job in terms of adding some more depth in terms of their defense. So keep, speaking of depth, uh, CF Montreal, so they realized that, you know, with recently Mason Toy and Romel Kyoto, uh, you know, both of those players are being injury prone. And one of those guys is still on the IR in Mason Toy. They feel like, yeah, it's time that they need to find another striker. And this also maybe, maybe is a move that they, that it pretty much confirmed that they might be letting go Beard Johnson uh, in the future and it, it's such a shame that that of course is the case because there was a lot of hype surrounding the fact that Bjorn Johnson is going to do well for this Montreal team even though he's been kind of a bit of a, a journeyman throughout his time and it seems like he's going to continue to do so because I think he's probably going to be leaving this team soon after the signing because they have signed another guy that that speaking of journeyman he is basically the ultimate journeyman and a guy that that you know I one day I'm definitely going to have to make a v video talk about probably the top five journeymen in, in MLS history because Kai Kamara is definitely living up to that that tag of being the ultimate journeyman. I mean, what? This is his 11 or 12 teams that he have joined in MLS. And what's interesting about Kai Kamara is that, you know, usually with journeymen, those are the players that are kind of like more like utility the players that kind of bounce around the league. But for Kai Kamara, he has quality in it, in, in him. It's just that, you know, it just feels like maybe he, he tends to like to go into a new new change of scenery almost every single season. And now at the age, I think, like 37 years old, you know, I, I feel like he, he still got, got some, some left in the tank. I mean, probably not a lo lot of it because I think maybe this might be the last team he's going to join before he's going to think about retirement. But, hey, you want to continue his legacy of being the ultimate journeyman of MLS, he's got to have to join another team. And now at CF Montreal as the late, latest team team that he have joined in MLS ever since he he came to to MLS uh about a decade and a half ago now uh Charlotte FC uh they have signed goalkeeper George Marks and defender Co Santos and notice both of those players are are super draft player that they drafted that they they of course decided to sign them on a permanent contract and you know while it's good the fact that they kind of booster their their goalkeeping depth and in terms of the defender depth the one concern I think Charlotte FC fans still have with this team is they still haven't fit, they still haven't improved their depth in terms of the midfield and especially have not done anything in terms of addressing their winger position and also uh, their their attack. I mean, there's a reason why Miguel Angel Romero says that this team is screwed because they're just not making any move to improve the the depth that they desperately need, which is in the midfield and in in the attack. I mean, when you look at the defense, it's actually looking. Like like a, a team that could be a playoff contender, but then when you look at the midfield and and the attack, it looked like a team that could could win the wooden spoon. And you know, I know Miguel Angel Ramirez after he he made his famous worst screw kind kind of speech, he also said that hopefully in these two weeks we're gonna make some more signings. And well, two weeks has passed, and so far from for besides the signing that Shard FC has made. They have made no signing whatsoever. And, you know, I mean, I, I hate to kind of keep keep landing that, that classic me, meme and probably the ultimate quote we've seen a head coach make during an interview. But, yeah, I, I feel like like Miguel Angel Ramirez has, some, ha, has the right to say that this team is screwed because of the way that, you know, they were supposed to, to make some signing and maybe these last two weeks was going to be uh, a week where they're just going to make some last-minute emergency signing to really... Feel a, a decent team, and that just does not seem like it's it's happening, and and it's also why why it's kind of befuddled befuddle why the Shard FC team is not do doing doing so for a team that it looked like they're all on verge of potentially could be competing FC Cincinnati of who actually is going to win win the wooden spoon this season. Now speaking of a team that signed their draft pick, uh, the Quakes also signed a draft pick player in Oscar Gar. Ar as a defender and I think this this makes perfect sense because I've heard a lot of people talk about he is one of the highly rated defender of the draft and which is why you know the Quakes also pay like I think a hundred thousand general allocation money to DC United in order to move up in the draft to acquire him and we'll see if that of course is the case because you know recently the Quakes have done a good job in terms of developing some some draft pick player to be decent player in MLS I mean guys like Jackson Yu 
when they got back in 2017. He's definitely been a bona fide star in that midfield. And then recently getting Tanner Beeson from a couple of years ago. He's now going to be a regular starter for that defender. And ultimately, if Oscar Argren is going to, to move up the depth chart. And, you know, if I see a Beeson and Argren kind of center back partnership... Oh, I'm going to be very, very, very happy about that because, you know, that's the ultimate midway of seeing a team using their draft pick and and developing being them into to just a sol, sol, solid kind of partnership as we see in, in that center-back partnership in the future. But overall, I think this is a, it's a good signing for, for this team that desperately needs some defender depth. Uh, now, the Vancouver Whitecaps have signed goalkeeper Thomas Assel on a contract extension, and this pretty much confirmed... That the Whitecaps are pretty much much put their their ha hands tied together and say that they yeah we were committing to Thomas Assel as the future of this uh, of the goalkeeper for this team and is the guy that's going to take over Maxim Crapole as the the future goalkeeper for this team and I, I've said said it many times before I feel like Thomas Assel is going to be a decent goalkeeper in this league but I just feel like he's not not ready yet and this year. I think, you know, I don't want to be too har harsh on, on him in, in this first year because, again, you know, he, he's still a very young young goalkeeper. But, you know, if he, he can maybe show at least a half or a free qu quarter of, of the, the the potential that, that uh, he ha ha he can potentially be. And, and of course, what, what, what Maxine Crepo was with this Vancouver team, I think Whitecaps fans would be very happy because, again, you know, it's unfortunate what happened with their situation with Crepo. But now they're going to be putting putting a, a goalkeeper that they know that he is going to be a guy that eventually going to take over for that spot once Crapo decided to leave somewhere else. But it's just that we didn't think that it was going to be be this year this year uh, for this upcoming season. Now uh, the New York Red Bulls have re-signed Tom Edwards on loan from Stoke City, and this is a massive signing for for the New York Red Bulls, knowing the fact that Tom Edwards was such a should be especially in in the fullback position probably one of the, the more underrated fullbacks in the league and there's been talks of the fact that maybe he's not going to be returning to this team and he's going to be going back to Stoke City well at least they're now able to get a deal to to extend him his stay with the Red Bulls and extend the loan deal and yeah again it's a very big big signing and especially with them after lo losing Kyle Duncan this offseason they really need to of course lock up Tom Edwards to not lose more fullback backs another fullbacks in their team and it seems like that of course is the case now uh moving on in terms of the next news and talk about some of the the reports and you know as the season began there really isn't going to be a lot of news in the transfer for rumors kind of mill but one news that kind of broke out out this afternoon and this is something that you know kind of maybe shocked a lot of people but at the same time maybe we kind of saw this coming and that of course is the future of carlos vela in in LAFC and that there's a report suggesting that he could be leaving LAFC after this season and decide to go back to Europe or join Inter Miami next season. Now, obviously, you know, we, we have see, seen that there's been rumors that Vela could be going back to Europe. And even though that's kind of a weird career path of him being in Europe, then go to MLS and then going back to Europe and also him getting up to, to his age and that, you know, I don't know if there's going to be any big team, especially in La Liga, that is going to take a chance chance for a guy that is is going to 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 approach his mid-30s and have been having some injury problem in the last couple of years but you know we kind of knew that this was going to, to be the case that Vela he, he feel like his time with LAFC is pretty much fulfilled and that he also kind of said that you know this is almost like all or nothing year for for him with LAFC which that doesn't sound like it's a good news good thing to say especially not really good news for LAFC fans knowing the fact that yeah, if this is an all-in year for, for you, I mean, we've seen before where, you know, we have seen teams that have said that they, they're all-in and they fail spectacularly, but we have also seen players that feels like it's kind of like an all-in year and then injuries, of course, happen. And, you know, we'll, we'll see, see again if Vela can be in that same form that he was in 2019. I mean, I don't think, for me, what he did in 2019, I don't think he's going to re replicate that. That was really the peak that, that we've seen with Carlos Vela with LAFC but if he can maybe at least get like 75% of his MVP year with this LAFC team this team can once again be an MLS Cup contender and I know I'm saying that because even though I've, I mentioned many times how it feels like the media is always thinking LAFC is an MLS Cup contender but yeah they have the pieces 
to to do so. And again, again, you know, we'll see whether or not if he can deliver that promise of bringing an MLS Cup to LAFC. Because again, it is pretty clear that it looks like he's either going to be going to Europe or going to Inter Miami too. Which you know, if you're an Inter Miami fan, you are definitely the, the hoping that that, of course, is the case. Because I mean, I I know I said that Carlos Vela is is kind of injury prone and he is starting to decline as he get into his mid thirties. But he still is considered one of the best play player in the league and one of the biggest name in in this league and to able to acquire acquire him i mean I, I guarantee he will definitely make inter miami much better even though inter miami is heading into a into a, a, a into a kind of a rebuild and into to a new direction where they're not just going to do what they originally think that they're going to do which is link with everybody around the world sign those age aging european player just to get butts in the stadium but instead actually do what a lot of mls team has been doing develop some young talent and hope to to build a squad that is good enough to compete for the playoffs and mls cup in the future uh now the houston dynamo has officially buy out joe corona contract and you know this is not a big surprise considering the fact that joe corona you know he didn't he didn't really look that good with with the houston dynamo and it was kind of a shame because you know i thought with him going to the Dynamo, some some change of scenery will kind of help help his career. But instead, it just also feels like he's kind of in the wrong side of thirties as as he is he's, he is now pa- past uh, his thirties. I think he's now like thirty one years old, and you know the Dynamo just kind of want no parts of it. Remember, this is a team that wants to get get younger, and you know they might also start get re- some of their placeholder uh, players when they feel like though they are are not going to be part. of of the future of this rebuild and joe corona is definitely one of those guys that was just bought in because of uh, of placeholder re- reason and just you use him at, at as a reclamation project before eventually maybe letting him go when they head into a new direction now uh speaking of disappointing player atlanta united have loaned eric lopez to banfield and you talk about another atlanta united player that you know we know atlanta united has always been famous in terms of finding these hidden jams player in south america and specifically argentina to, to develop them before selling off to europe but unfortunately ever since they 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 did that that and sell miguel almaron for still right now a record 27 million dollar transfer outgoing fee to newcastle united they've kind of almost hit 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 rough diamonds with with, with the way that they have trying to get these young south american player and develop them and move to Europe and Eric Lopez is a great example of it and his, his career with Atlanta was kind of strange too because when he started with this team he was loaned to the second team which I thought he was just too good to be be playing in the USL championship with the quality he has and then once he go into the main team he really kind of struggled to really get 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 into the start starting 11 or even he, he, even I think he had some injury concern last season too so yeah I mean you know it's unfortunate to see see that that of course is the case but let's see if Lopez can go to Banfield and maybe maybe be do well with with that team so he can maybe get back to Atlanta United and and, and get his, his confidence up so that he can live up to his to his potential that he has now moving on in terms of talking about some other news unrelated to some of the transfer signings rumor and players leaving to to another league is DC United. So they named XDC Network as their jersey sponsor, which I believe this is the first club to name their jersey sponsor after a cryptocurrency. And, you know, like it or hate it, cryptocurrency is definitely a big, big topic in in the world right now. And it, a lot of people have said that that's going to be kind of the f- future of how, how trading is going to, to work. But yeah, you know, you know, it's going to be, I think it's going to be interesting to see how this is going to go go in terms of the direction of whether or not if more teams are going going to maybe maybe use one of their their jersey sponsor or even their their stadium name sponsor from from a cryptocurrency because I've seen in other other leagues where there are actually some some stadium that is literally named after a cryptocurrency probably the most famous right now is is where where the Lakers the Clippers and the, the Kings play at the Staples Center well it's not called the Staples Center anymore but it's now called called the crypto.com center and again it still feels weird to call that that consider that is considered one of the most famous arena in in the world and probably right uh, won't be up there in terms of Madison Square Garden as the most famous arena in the world but definitely up, up there and that 
you know, all this time, it's always known as the Staples Center, and it's kind of weird now that that a big, big corporate kind of cryptocurrency company bought the the naming rights, and that, I feel like that's going to be continue the the trend in the future, like it or not. And then finally, the last news we're going to talk about is the U.S. Women's National Team and U.S. Soccer Federation has officially reached a settlement agreement to resolve a long-standing equal pay dis dispute. Now, I'm not going to go too deep into to this. In fact, I'll probably just kind of mention only a little bit about this because if i go too deep into the, this yeah i'm gonna it, i'm gonna probably get get political and you know when you try to be political on youtube it's not going to end, end up well but basically what this does is the fact that i from what i also heard is that there's going to be like a like a a collective bargain agreement that the 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 u.s soccer federation is going to create for both their 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 national team and that of course is the men's and women's one and i think that probably is the first time i've seen seen a soccer federation have decided to have a collective bargain agreement with their two two separate team but that's what happened when you have have the men's national team having a lot of expectation and then of course the women's team always known as the dominant for force in the world but again you know there there seems to be mixed opinions in terms terms of this there's some sides say that this is kind of long overdue and it feels like a victory for the u.s women's national team that have long been want want to, to have an equal pay and pay the same as the men's team but then there's also a lot of people say that this is a bad bad thing and that there's even the, a report saying that part of the the cba that that the u.s soccer federation is going to include is going to be they're going to take some money away from from the men men's team and put it into the women's team so that you can have, have an equal pay and that seems like kind of extreme extremely unfair and that it feels like maybe the the women's team is playing that 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 feminist car just to to do so but again that's as far as i'm gonna go in terms of talk about that i'm definitely not gonna pick a side because if i pick a side there's gonna be a lot of people vote in the comments section writing some angry things and there's gonna be a lot of dislike in this video i mean you know the I, I will say say that you know ever since YouTube of course decided to get rid of of uh, well they didn't get rid of the dislike button but get rid of the dislike count you know you, I I would definitely don't know like how many people actually dislike my video and I I in some way kind of agree, agree with some people saying that that I feel like that's bad bad for YouTube to just kind of get rid of the dislike count because I feel like there's there should be a point where it should be shown that yeah this video that that the content creator made is absolutely terrible and it is deserved to 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 be criticized with the, the dislike button but you know again i feel like if i get into that that topic again that's also a very sensitive topic and i'll just kind of kind of leave it to that and say that we'll see how things of course is going to go, go out because you know besides the settlement agreement that they're going to do this is still a long way to go in terms of the the main thing thing that that you know both the u.s women's national team and the u.s soccer federation is going to keep an eye on is the new new cba that's going to be created with the men's national team and women's team and we'll see whether or not if both sides of course would agree and something tells me both sides not going to be agreed i mean if you're the men's side why would you agree in terms of the fact that there could be a potential where some of the money that 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 you might have get is now going to be taken away and put into the women's game just because of both these national teams should get equal pay because of that but either way hope you guys enjoyed this video if you do make sure you guys see a like smash the subscribe button let me know in the comments below what do you think of this video and all those news i've uh, talked about and if there's any news i didn't mention here on the board let me know in the comments below but yeah hope you guys enjoyed this video and i will see you guys next time